I have to say that I am so blessed and so honored to be here and to be able to share my story and talk about my beginnings and how I was able to really see my dreams become a reality. Growing up in East St. Louis, Illinois, and all I really wanted to do was to make my parents proud. And I didn't know I was blessed with this athletic gift that would allow me to eventually travel the world and do some outstanding things in my sport. My mom only cared about me getting an education and eventually getting a job because she didn't have a clue when it came to athletics. She didn't care about me running. All she wanted me to do is to make sure that I came home before the street lights came on and that I had my homework done and that my room was clean. So me and my two sisters, you know, we were always try to work together. Me being the oldest girl, you know, I would have to sometimes give them a little bit of my lunch money, even though it might have only been 15 cents at the time. But if I gave them a nickel a piece, then one would clean my room, one would wash the dishes, and then I can go <laughs> and be able to do my sports. <laughs> so I tried to figure out a way how I was going to be able to do this. And I was very fortunate to be introduced to athletics through a community center. And it was people in that community center that really taught me a lot about volunteering going into the library, being able to check out a book, being able to do a book report. And those individuals over there became a part of my extended family. And from there, because I didn't really know my grandparents, and they had a senior citizen program called Meals on Wheels. And a lot of times I would find myself in the arts and craft room working with the senior citizens. And they would always put their wisdom on me and be telling me different things. And I didn't quite understand what they were trying to relate to me at that time. But I, as I continued to develop and continue to grow, I felt that those individuals, those seniors, really were like my grandparents, almost like my parents, because I saw them every day when I went over to that center. And it was my mom who said to me that she doesn't know what I'm doing out on the athletic field. She wanted me to read the newspaper. I was like, really? <laughs> okay, I'm gonna read the newspaper. But not only did I have to read the newspaper, I had to tell her what I was reading. And the reason my mother was extremely tough on me is because her and my dad had us as teenagers. And myself being the oldest girl, I was always told when I was growing up, by the time I was 14, I was gonna be pregnant and I wasn't gonna to amount to anything. But in my mindset, I always had goals, I always had dreams. I didn't know exactly what I wanted to do, but I knew whatever I was going to accomplish, I was going to make my mom proud because my mother struggled day in and day out. My mother wasn't fortunate enough to graduate from junior high school because she had us when she was in junior high school. And my mother gave me so much strength, so much wisdom. She taught me a lot about life. When I was teasing or when I didn't want to hear, it was the things that she taught me at a very young age that I had to reflect on as I continued to develop and continue to grow. And as I became an outstanding athlete, I was sharing my mom about the things that I wanted to do athletically. I thought maybe I could go to the Olympics, I told her. I said, the coaches said, told us to watch the Olympics on television. And I said that, I think, you know, one day I'm going to be able to do that because I want to be on TV. <laughs> <You know? laughs> I said, I think I can get on TV by going to the Olympics. <laughs> and my mom was like, yeah, keep reading them books, keep working hard. <laughs> you know. I don't want to hear that. <laughs> and, but my coaches said that I had the potential, that I had to be willing to work hard. And in working hard to me, I thought I was working hard. But then I realized that from my junior Olympic competitions that I wasn't one of the best girls. I was not one of the best. My first race, I finished last. And I said to myself that, wow, if I want to do this, I, I can't be finishing last. And so, <laughs> You know, 
I said to myself that if I can improve a tenth of a second, if I'm running or a half of an inch, if I'm jumping, then that meant that the work that I was doing was starting to pay off. So in doing that, I saw my times getting better. But then I realized that one through three stood on the podium. Four through eight was always on the grass. And I was always on the grass. And I got tired of looking up at the people on the podium. And I said, I want to get on the podium. So eventually I went from last place to sixth place, eventually fourth place. And then eventually when I tasted standing on that podium, it felt good to be in third position. But wow, I said, no, third is not good enough. I want to be on the top. And I started setting my sights on being on the top three because the top three would make any national team, any Olympic team, or any team that's going to represent the USA. So my senior year, I had an opportunity to go to the Olympic trials in Eugene, Oregon. And I didn't know what to expect. I was right out of high school. Well, I was still in high school, and I was like, wow. I went to those Olympic trials, and I competed in the long jump, which is one of the events that I do, is what you hit the board, and you, I call it you jump into the sandbox. For those of you that's not familiar with it, that's the long jump. And <laughs> I finished eighth. But I, what I remember about going to those Olympic trials was a man by the name of Brooks Johnson. He used to be the Stanford coach. And he came to me and he whispered in my ear that the Lord works in mysterious ways. And I didn't know him and I didn't know why he said that to me. <laughs> like, thank you, sir. That's what I was doing because I was taught to be respectful. And I told my high school coach, and he told me, you know who that is that just spoke to you? I said, no, I don't. <laughs> he said, he's one of the greatest coaches in our sport. And I said, oh, I remember because he called me because he was trying to recruit me to come to Stanford. And I really didn't even know a whole lot about the state of California. All I knew is that California was nice, beautiful, and warm. And he let me know Northern California get a little cooler than Southern California. I'm like, oh, okay. <laughs> but I think I want to go to Southern California where the warm weather is. But anyway, as I continue on my journey, and four years later, after receiving a scholarship to UCLA and having an opportunity to compete in different world championships and my hopes was trying to make an Olympic team. And I had my first opportunity in 1984 to make my first Olympic team. And in making my first Olympic team at our Olympic trials, I had set our national record. I was doing extremely well. And then all of a sudden, you know, with the Eastern Bloc countries boycotting the, the summer games because of what had happened in 1980, that I was picked uh, to win the gold medal at these Olympic Games. So in 1984, after having a great Olympic trials, going into the Olympic Games, maybe probably about three weeks, maybe four weeks out from the, uh, from the Games, I ended up straining my hamstring muscle. At the time, I thought it was a pull muscle. And I had never been injured before. I could always ask my body to do what I wanted it to do or respond in the way that I wanted it to respond. And as I'm working with my physical therapist and my coach, and they're all telling me everything is going to be okay, but in my heart and in my mind, I didn't believe it because I wasn't used to looking down at my leg being black and blue when they're saying that it's okay and the muscle is not a muscle in a place where a muscle shouldn't be because it's swollen. And I'm saying that, no, something is wrong. And they're saying, no, it's okay. It can't be okay. It's black and blue. You telling me it's okay? All they wanted me to do was focus on what I need to focus on. But being young and somewhat naive, I was so caught up into a pain that really wasn't there. And as I went to the, to the Olympic Games, and at the start line of the 100-meter hurdles, the first event in the heptathlon, I went there anticipating a pain that would never come. As I blast out of the blocks, the first three hurdles, everything is going according to the plan. But in my mind, 
my leg is heavily bandaged. Something is wrong. And as I attack four, five, and six hurdle, still doing well. And as I come through seven, eight, nine, ten, 10, cross the finish line, looking for a pain that wasn't there. My attitude continue on to go into the high jump, the second event. My left leg is the leg that's heavily bandaged. That's my takeoff leg in the high jump. And as I approach the high jump bar, I'm looking for that grabbing sensation. It's not there. Same attitude with the shot put. It's about, it weighs four kilos, about nine pounds. I got to toss that with all my might. And as I'm trying to toss it, as I'm trying to throw it, it's going, but I'm looking for a pain. It's not there. The last event on the first day, the 200 meters, as I approach the start blocks, and as I get into the blocks, I kick my legs out, I stretch them, I get in there, the gun goes off, I come around the curve, I'm running well, but I'm still searching and looking for a pain. That's not there. The next day, we're prior to the next day, my physical therapist, my coach, rub down, ice, we do everything, you know, and I'm, you know, I'm like, oh, probably should be icing my brain because, you know, something's not right. I just know it's not right, but I'm trying to go with the plan and not realizing that I'm putting myself in a position of disbelief. I'm doubting everything that I have trained for and all the people who believed in me.